Okay, it's a pleasure to have you with us. It's been such a dynamic morning or afternoon or evening, depending upon what part of the world one happens uh, to be in. And it's my pleasure to introduce our final panel. And the purpose of this panel is to explore the myriad tensions found in the historiography of art. And we understand that art can serve as a vehicle to inform, invoke, and evoke. And for this panel, we want to engage in a nuanced conversation about power, the power of art to influence, harm, and also to heal. And so with that, I couldn't be joined by a better, um, by, by a better group of, of artists, thinkers, um, who are so much more than their art. And so joining us are Kwame Okoto Bamfo, a Ghanaian sculptor uh, who uses his skills in such brilliant ways to create projects that honor ancestors portraits of Africans who were imprisoned, kidnapped, or coerced into slavery. And the articulation of kidnap is so important because that's often uh, overlooked, kidnap traffic. Um, I'm also joined by uh, Leila Amandindole, but you have to pronounce, help me, Leila, in case I've not done well and honored your, your name, um, okay. whose work um, studies these issues, looks at these issues from the perspective of law and more in terms of art, heritage, and intellectual property. Callan, I'm so happy that you are joining us, Callan Hawksworth, uh, who was brought to my attention by the very um, intriguing and impactful work around the narratives and the effigies involving Sarah Bartman, such an incredibly important history. And then also by Tom, Tom Lofman, who is the director and the CEO of the Wadsworth uh, Athenaeum Museum of Art. Um, and so couldn't be happier to have you all with us. And so it can be taken for granted, the role of art um, in the ways in which it imagines narratives and the way in which it uses narratives, sometimes stereotype, sometimes to caricature, and sometimes to stigmatize, particularly along the lines of race and sex. Uh, and so with this panel, we really want to provide uh, broad themed questions. And so let me start with this. As we are concerned with reckoning and reconciliation, we want to start by thinking about the ways in which art has served as a vehicle to stereotype and to stigmatize. What are your thoughts? And I'm going to start this question with you, Kellen. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle. And a uh, pleasure to be here with my fellow panelists. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, to begin, uh, one of the main ways uh, as a performance scholar, I relate to the, the potential for art as a form of injury or harm to stigmatize, to stereotype. Uh, I'll respond on, uh, based on my current project, which is that Black people will see as a global phenomenon. Um, this is a performance form, uh, as people may know, uh, in which white uh, performers, majority male, uh, performed as black uh, people, diasporic peoples. Um, one of the interesting factors of this is that this is not uh, unique to the United States. It's something that actually precedes uh, the formation of the United States and traveled throughout the British Empire. And uh, one of the ways that this performance form worked was to instill images, instill ideas about Black peoples um, through any number of uh, axes of oppression. Uh, so anything that was uh, accorded to white people, uh, the opposite was believed of Black people and uh, acted out. Uh, so for instance, if white, pe white people have access to speech, then Black people do not have access to speech. Um, if pe uh, white people have access to freedom, then Black people do not have access to freedom. Uh, and you can go down a uh, sort of infinite list of how uh, this form, uh, which was the most popular form of the 19th century, uh, instilled cultural scripts that people took as the real. And that this is something that um, is quite important to, to think about with art is how it is ult ultimately also productive of ideas, productive of 
perspectives per, uh, productive of how people understand their world uh, as a, a sort of claim to the real or a lens through which to perceive it. And uh, forms like blackface minstrelsy, uh, as well as the ethnological display of Sarah Bartman, which uh, Michelle uh, referenced a moment ago, were all a means of using performance actually to perpetuate and prop up structures of oppression by abjecting others. Well, it's interesting because that also has its own commercial appeal too, right? So there's this sort of appeal to that in terms of a kind of art form, which one could see in theater. We could even see in, in movies, early movies um, engage that. Um, and you could see that in books, but it's also very interesting to see how that was commercialized and how we're still kind of living within the fumes of that, right? Uncle Ben, Aunt Jemima, right? Like used to sell products, this minstrelsy that still exists, although morphing in different ways. I want to engage others in this conversation then that you started us with in that way. And I want to turn to you, Tom, because you're smiling and nodding <laughs> about this. And you must think about this as you lead a museum. So yeah. What's the power behind this? No, I mean, totally. I just, you know, thank you so much. And I really um, have enjoyed the whole afternoon. So I'm in, I'm in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, as you said, I'm the director of an art museum. It's America's oldest public art museum. Yeah, we were founded with private philanthropy and operate with private philanthropy. So it's one of the great I ironies of the American culture sector that so much public good is trying to come out of private, private hands. Uh, just a couple of things. I am smiling because it is, it's been so um, present in my time as both an art historian and as an art administrator. You know, art making has always been political and always been social for as long as human beings have been doing it. Um, art making like language, like theater, like music uh, is an approximation or a fiction. So either people are trying to go and make things seem real and you know, art, art for a long, long time took great pride in artifice. It took pride in the fact that it seemed real-like, but, but in a cultural setting where many people recognize that it wasn't the real thing. So that, that idea that it creates fiction has been powerful. And on the flip, you know, um, that power has been used to consolidate power, to intimidate, to manipulate through awe and grandeur to deride others, to establish hierarchies, to unite, to divide, to inspire, to stunt, um, so actively throughout the history of art. And so there's that, and then on another level, its display has always been social. Even for things that were considered private works of art for one person's enjoyment or for a household enjoyment, there's always been this tension. Is who, who is being showed what? Who can see? Who's allowed in? What gets showed? Um, these are all decisions. What gets phys physically shared? What do you actually, as an artist, go out and sell? Or what do you agree to make on commission? Um, and then when those things are owned and sold and traded and circulated, um, there are all kinds of decisions going on there. Um, it's, it's dislocation and destruction and creative reuse has never been far uh, from view. Although we in America, in this hemisphere, we have a different perspective than say in Asia or Europe where there's no doubt about the assertiveness of cultural hegemony, of state power, of religious power. And, and so anyway, we have a different, we have a different place uh, here in the Americas. We have a different place here in New England, you know, he, where four centuries ago, there was this multiple European subcultures coming in contact and often conflict with multiple indigenous ones um, where there was substantial overt civil and social trauma up through the 19th century. And then also concurrent with that and up through now, uh, a, a, a covert social trauma constantly in flux. Oh, we can't hear you, Michelle. Thank you. It's interesting that you should mention that. I want to bring Kwame into this too, because it's the hundreds of years ago with Europeans coming in colonizing, and then you're in the East Coast, and I can't help but think about then the kind of internalized classism and racism, Nina, no Irish need apply, and the stereotypes, 
within white communities about white folks. And so maybe we'll get into a bit of, of that too. That just kind of explores all of the fluidities. But Kwame, your work is political. Your work seek, seeks to counter these narratives um, that stereotype and stigmatize or that limit the expressions of how we understand Black people and how we understand that journey from Ghana, from the shores to all parts of the world, right? You know, Black folks weren't just kidnapped and brought straight to what became the United States, but were kidnapped and trafficked and taken to the Caribbean, South America, Central America, and other places. So tell us about why you do this work and what it is that you're looking for people to understand from your work. Um, well, um, thank you for this question and thank you for letting me be part of this panel. Thank you um, for being with us. <laughs> yeah, uh, there, there, there are so many um, reasons why I do this work and one of the reasons being that um, I wanted to contribute to um, Africans telling their own story about this uh, specific phenomenon being the transatlantic slave uh, slave trade, and in fact the the phenomenon of um, the African or Black people being uh, considered the other or being considered subhuman, and with art having been used or art being weaponized as a tool uh, for this. Um, for the continuous oppression of Black people all over. And um, yeah, uh, I, I, I found out they were in so many layers. Uh, in fact, I, I had no idea the, the journey I was going to make when I decided to do this. Um, I found out there were so many layers and um, the moment I, I started doing this, uh, African enslavement and oppression was just going to be a, a section. Um, should we say um, something I was going to tackle for a specific period until I realized that I needed to do this more because there were so many layers that has not been addressed all over the world. And that's, that's how I do, that's why I do this. Um, it's been 10 years working on just, uh, I've been working on African heritage in total, but it's been 10 years, about 14 years since I've been working on um, black oppression, African oppression, um, and then healing and reconciliation. Yes. So, and even that 10 years, I find out is not enough. No, not no. all. So much to cover, right? Um, I want to turn yeah. to you, Leela, and I want to lift up a a question that's actually been put in our Q&A that's, that's part of this, which is to think about a disability uh, and how access, it, well, it's, it's interesting because there are many forms of this, right? Because part of the stereotype and stigmatization in part is to form some version of thinking about the other, somebody who is you sort of not as we think about uh, in terms of full. And then at the same time, there are the complications of, and that's a, that's a, a, such a nuanced kind of way of thinking anyway, right? That we have to unpack. And then I think about access, right? Which also engages the questions of ability and disability. How do you sit with that, right? Like it's a, it's a very, um, let's say it, it's a question that lacks sophistication. It's an imperfect question, but I want to lift up the importance of think about, thinking about disability as it relates to the matters that are on the table. And then I wish for everybody to turn off, turn on their mics and share in. Sure. So a couple of things. First off, I'm so pleased to, that you invited me to speak on this panel today. And each one of the speakers that have spoken, has spoken on the panel so far um, has led me to jot down all these notes. And I just before I answer that question, I want to mention that I love what Tom said about art always being political. This is something that I often discuss. I'm, I'm an attorney and I teach an art law class and we talk about the political nature of art, which actually gets to access of art as well. Um, and also what Kwame said about art being weaponized and I love that. So thinking about access, um, one topic that my students and I spend time examining is what 
the Nazi party did during the 20th century with art and how they created art that was offensive and stigmatized and stereotyped people and treated them as the other. And also the fact that they destroyed art and removed artwork from people and tried to destroy a culture. Um, and I, you know, that's happening around the world. We talk about the Nazis because so much of it has been recorded. There's so much in history. And after the end of World War II, at least legally, courts tried to unwind some of these transactions and return property. And a lot of my work is in ownership. So I come across those issues, but really how the world had to deal with unwinding those transactions and trying to create more access and equality to art. So when I look at objects themselves, I think about access and then I think about the other side. So my work is kind of split in two. One part is actually dealing with property itself. And the other half of my work is dealing with intellectual property and artists and allowing artists to have the access to speak and to create art and to disseminate art and to be able to place art in exhibitions and in public spaces so that art isn't just available to say a small sub you know, subgroup of people or one national group of people or one particular community, but to have their art being displayed and shared with the community at large. So let's build from there and go a little bit deeper, um, if you will, given all of the richness that you've all put on the table here. And I want to think about the political dimensions of art, some of the contestations regarding race, sex, and vulnerability in art. And perhaps as a lead in, um, I, I want to think about um, what were called the freak shows, right? This kind of circusness. This gets us back to Sarah Bartman. Um, this this way of exploiting the sort of people who are othered as being such a kind of popular mechanism for people to go and be entertained. Can you tell us anything about those histories and what they? what they say about who we are. What do they say about people in the United States and also in England and, and throughout Europe where Sarah Bartman uh, was placed on you know, tour. And then strangely enough, after that, if you could speak to that specifically, Kellen, the, the history of after she's dead, what happens to her body? And maybe let's start with you, Kellen. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So. Um... One aspect of the, the freak show is it is fundamentally uh, structured on othering. Who is ever on the stage, who is placed on display, is someone who has already been separated from a given community and made into a spectacle, uh, made into a representation of whatever this community identifies as, the, uh, as what they are not. And uh, it is a moment uh, of, of structural violence to actually just draw that line and put someone into that position. Um, and as you've said, this was something uh, that uh, connects any number of peoples throughout the, the, the globe. Colonized peoples uh, were often taken and put on display. Um, to answer the question in the chat, uh, there is, of course, uh, following uh, the work of someone like a P.T. Barnum, who was uh, not as he is portrayed in the movie, uh, was very much someone who was uh, very interested in producing theater that made people appear especially spectacularly different, made people, uh, allowed audiences to view uh, people who are racially different from a white majority audience uh, to also be disabled or in some way uh, biologically different from a white audience. And so uh, to bring this back to Sarah Bartman, uh, there is this production of her as was right for our audience who may not know exactly who, who she was. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Sarah Bartman uh, is someone who was born in uh, the Cape Colony of South Africa. Uh, so uh, originally this was a Dutch colony that the British take over. Uh, Sarah Bartman was transported from Cape Town to London. Uh, we actually have no clear evidence as to whether she went willingly or not. We have very little information from her perspective. Um, when she gets to London, she is put on ethnological display, uh, an early sort of sideshow, freak show, uh, but a standalone production that is carefully stage managed theater. Um, there were people who were actively emceeing this performance, uh, actively dressing, costuming, uh, and there are even moments in which the audience was invited to touch, to uh, basically grope her body. 
in order to get a sense of the reality of this body, right? Um, and there's a, a deep fascination with, uh, a popular fascination with what is happening politically at the level of imperialism and colonization. Um, that is, uh, we're seeing sort of two different levels of that acting, uh, coming together in these displays. And upon her death, uh, she actually dies in Paris. And uh, Georges Cuvier, who is the surgeon to Napoleon, uh, dissects her body post-mortem, uh, seeking out the, the biological truth or fact of her racial difference, which of course has been produced theatrically, produced through these representations, but now trying to confirm it at the level of biology. Uh, and this goes into any number of medical textbooks. People actually uh, try to place her uh, racially within the great chain of being. Uh, some even posit her as being uh, the quote unquote missing link, right, between apes and man. Uh, so much so that she also remains on display in a French museum, the Musée de l'Homme in Paris until the 1970s. A plaster cast that was made of her body also remained on display until the 1970s. And she was not repatriated to South Africa until 2002 after a series of political movements, both in South Africa and a, a petition within the Parisian legislature, uh, the French legislature to actually return and reinter her remains in South Africa where she now rests. So thank you for that, Kelly. I would like to turn to you, Kwame, in light of what we've just heard and the kind of caricaturing and exploitation of bodies of, of color or other bodies um, through tropes of, of art. And I want to turn to you um, and ask you about the power of the work that you do in trying to reestablish, reimagine, tell a story about Black people and their bodies that's different than these kind of colonial narratives. Um, do you find pushback? on that. Um, do you find that it's challenging to tell an authentic story? And of course, what is an authentic story about a Black body? Yeah, uh, it is very challenging uh, working on this because um, like uh, reiterating on what Leila and Kellen uh, talked about, um, the very Blackness is, uh, is 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 otherhood. The uh, your very blackness is described as fetish. So um, even finding um, the right word to communicate what you um, we were in Ghana, we were describing our work, our works, and our religion as fetish before we even knew about the the negative connotations. So you are never authentic enough. You are, you are communicating in a language that is other than yours. You are never authentic enough. You are never good enough. You are, and just so people get the, the, how deep this goes, before our ancestors stepped foot in, uh, in the new world and, and became African Americans or Black British or you know Caribbeans, they were already other. They were already freaks. So the the freak show had already your 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 whole body, your whole personality was already freak show before you 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 even started to dialogue with your art. And we have people here still ongoing who are trying to bleach their skins to avoid becoming freak shows. So this thing is running deep and it is going on now. And up until 2002, when I entered university, I didn't know that the word fetish had negative connotations. I would use it to describe my work or I would try and use it to describe traditional work, thinking it was positive, when by, by design, by construct, I am already set to fail in trying to, you know, work against the stereotype, the trope that I'm even fighting against. So there is a lot of pushback. Um, I have to read extra 
I have to research extra terminolo uh, terminology is, 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 is huge. It's, um, it's, on this journey, I, I had a master's degree and I was lecturing, but it took someone to tell me to draw my attention to the terminology slave versus enslaved because English is not my first language. So it's, um, it's a whole lot, it runs deep. And um, that's how come uh, Brian Stevenson invited me to bring our part of the narrative because being the otherhood in America started from somewhere and it started right from the continent. So before our ancestors set foot in the new world, they were already the other, they were already the freaks. Um, that validated they are being enslaved. And so that's what my art is trying to do and trying to work against. There is a lot of pushback, yeah. It's, it's interesting that it's you said that. And I, I come back, to, I think I get a little bit of reverberation when I speak and your mic is on, Kwame. Um, yeah. It reminds me of uh, Toni Morrison and Toni Morrison's work, The Bluest Eye, and he's speaking to colorism and, and you, what you were saying is that inscribed from the very beginning, you, you, you're almost from the very beginning have no potential for something different because the inscription is already there that it will not be anything different except this way in which we see you. And I see the power of your work as being resistance to that. And I also see the sort of power of the people, the diaspora that landed throughout Central South America, the Caribbean, uh, this kind of new world of what became the United States as being resistance to that. You know, one thing I want to add, and then I want to turn over to Tom, because I'm curious then how museums deal with this, how museums deal with these kinds of tensions. What do you take in uh, and what do you present to your audience, especially in light of some controversy this week involving an Indiana museum, which maybe you might touch on a little bit. Um, but, but it reminds me this kind of the way in which you framed this conversation, Kwame, in, in your answer, it makes me think about the people who after kidnapped were landed, let's say, in what became the United States and the kind of power that they must have had. I wondered what narratives they told, what they shared, knowing that their children would be sold off. Like, what do you say when you are a mom? And you know tomorrow your five-year-old child will be sold off and you will perhaps never see her again. You, you have no car. There is no train for you. Um, there is no system that allows you to be in court and say, that is my child that you are selling off. None of that. So what do you say? What do you do to keep that child whole and to fight and resist then what the stereotype is that is kind of bounded in the culture and that people get through the art and literature that they want and that they consume. All right, I just had to put that out there. Tom, now turning to you, how do museums no. handle these questions? These are the questions. And I think that the that what's, what's sometimes disorienting uh, for all our conversations is um, museums are in libraries and, and other things, that, places that collect things in, for their thingness are often misunderstood um, because what, what we talk about too much is what we do, which is description, which is different than what we are here to do, which is purpose. So, you know, the museum project, which is a, you know, idea of the 18th century, realized first in the 19th century, refined in the late 20th century, and really exploded in the 21st century, you know, it's predicated on the idea of promoting promoting mutual understanding, particularly at a place that's a universalist museum where we really collect art from the past 500 years. We have some antiquities. We're not a whole world art collection here. But, you know, my goal is to create dignity for all. My goal is to get people back in touch with their own humanity through seeing things from all over the world. Um, my goal that I talk about motivating the staff with is inciting human curiosity, which is one thing. But some people might see the opportunity to see something from a place far away made by people not like them as exoticism or 
at its worst, an encouragement so towards a supremism that denigrates others. Right? With these comparisons of, That's, I mean, yeah. there used to be a term, you know, primitive art. We talk about the Nazis, they got rid of Entarte der Kunst. Uh, this, this conflict between uh, kind of a positive purpose of, of building a room, of convening, of convening the possibility. Um, yeah, well, it's interesting that you should say that, right? Because you think about even like the tensions between what's considered primitive art or even folk art. Who's yeah. the person that actually gets to be an artist, right? And so Leela, um, I'd love to have you join in on this, right? In terms of um, who gets to be an artist? What is it that we sort of count as art? And what you know does it mean when we, we think about the appropriation of others' art? And those are contemporary questions that are in continuous debate, whether we're talking about art that was stolen by the Nazis, whether we're talking about the European museums that are shock full of art from all over the world that's not given back, or whether we're talking about these questions in the United States involving indigenous cultures and their artworks held at universities and museums where there are communities that say, we want it back. Wow, <laughs> there's I so a lot. It's a lot, but I know you can do it. I know you can handle it. <laughs> a lot to say. So one thing, and then I'm going to give Michelle, I'm going to get to the heart of your question, I think. But one thing that I just wanted to comment on was Tom's discussion of like objects versus purpose. And I think that brings up the topic of context. Maybe that's something we'll discuss in a minute, because it also, I think context is a topic that a lot of people are talking about, especially in reference to like Confederate statues and the removal of monuments that are controversial, which I think is a great topic to discuss. And it's, it's a long one. So perhaps everyone else would like to discuss it as well. But in terms of returning pieces and how pieces are being seen in museums, um, again, I think there's context as well. How are we labeling this art? I mean, there are terms that you mentioned like primitive art, outsider art that are offensive and, you know, place this artwork on a different scale than old masters and, you know, objects that we all admire. So there is this inequality. We create an inequality in the art and how we present it and in the context that we present these pieces. And of course, about ownership. I mean, there's been inequality in how we own art as well, which groups of people were able to go into different countries or into different communities or to you know, native tribes and take their property and put that property in a context that is completely different than completely, I guess, in contravention to the actual purpose of this art. So I think about like Native American art and like burial objects, objects that were supposed to remain with the bodies of um, ancestors for these communities and now are on display and you know the number of legal cases that have come up involving these works or you know these objects that were never intended to be seen that were never intended to be removed you know from accompanying the body in a burial um, and I think a lot of these issues are being discussed uh, I think it's really great to see some of these legal cases in which objects eventually are being returned and I think these discussions are really coming to the forefront about colonialism and how objects were taken under force, like really brute force, um, and how those objects we should be discussing, whether they should be returned, whether they should be displayed in a different context, who we can return objects to, because in some cases, we don't even necessarily have the mechanism to return the object to the original owner or the heirs. So really complex questions about ownership. So in fact, I'd like to build on that too, then because you teach um, you teach these issues. And I'm wondering about the kinds of discussions that you have with your students because I, you know, what one hears, and I don't know if this comes up in class, is that, well, the, the public would be denied um, the, the value and the benefit of seeing this art if it were not displayed. Um, how do you respond to that? And I'll, you know, the other panelists, you can go, you know, live and unmute yourselves to respond to that question. What's the response when people say, but the world needs to see this? Well, there are a few different contexts in which that comes up in the context of, let's say, colonialism. Um, legally, that question's really 
difficult. If a country was under the rule of, you know, a governing body that took those objects, you know, perhaps legally there isn't much to, you know, to be done. However, ethically, I think it's a totally other question. When you look at that object and you know that you're displaying something that was taken with violence, there's, you know, there's that ethical issue, that moral issue to consider against, well, let everyone see it. Um, I also think, and I'm just, I think this is related to your, your question. Um, you know, we look at Nazi looted art, for example, that, that argument does come up. Why are we returning this object to one person? And I think that when we internalize what had happened, you see a face, right? And you see an individual and you say, wow, that person lost their entire family. And this is the only remnant they have of their grandparent. It needs to go back to that person. I think it's a more difficult thing to see within a nation. So I deal a lot with international disputes of ownership. And I think when you look at something in that abstract way, I think people lose that personal connection. Like people, let's say, um, more recently, the Netherlands said that they were going to return, the government was going to return a number of objects to countries that it had colonized, including Indonesia. When you look at the country of Indonesia, it's very abstract. But when you can see a face, it's much more concrete. And you have to realize that the people of Indonesia, like an entire nation, would find significance and has some type of connection. And I think we shouldn't forget that. I, I think it's an impossible thing. It's, it's a terrible thing to forget that people have a connection as part of their heritage. You know, the previous panel, um, some of the individuals spoke about their culture being embodied in them, like a body that contains this culture and this past. And I think a nation contains that as well. When you think about national heritage or tribal ownership or community ownership, I, I think that's really powerful as well. So Kellen, I see you nodding to this. Did you want to add to that, this question about repatriation and what that means? Yeah, um, so so a couple of different uh, responses. I, I sort of have two different directions to go with this. Uh, the, the first is that, uh, again, Sarah Bartman's actual remains uh, were considered, were transformed into art objects, right? On display, not in an art museum, but in a, a, a science museum. Um, but very much put on display and staged, right, as a spectacle for people uh, to go and view. And the repatriation process started through uh, a series of protests, uh, actually started through a work of art, a poem by Diana Ferris, uh, titled, I've Come to Take You Home. And so this poem finds its way to a French member of the legislature, who then writes a bill to actually initiate this process. Um, again, vastly belated, um, in no way necessarily fully repairing uh, or ameliorating any of the damage done, either to Bartman or to uh, any of her uh, people who claim her as a member of their tribe, right, or of their race, um, and yet a very significant moment in which she is given a state funeral in South Africa upon her return. Um, so in that sense, right, there is a profound set of uh, new possibilities for social, political gathering, uh, for the beginnings of some form of healing, uh, again, that can emerge out of these processes. I also want to uh, speak to a recent development in South Africa, which was the Roads Must Fall protest that uh, actually spread uh, to England as well, where Cecil John Rhodes also has a legacy. Um, and certainly uh, the resonance that this has with our uh, statuary controversies and debates in the United States. Um, I came to my work on Sarah Bartman because of the Roads Must Fall protests, because they were uh, actually protesting the uh, presence of a statue of Cecil John Rhodes, who is an imperialist uh, in Southern Africa. Uh, he is the founder of the De Beers Diamond Company. Um, and he actually bequeathed the land that the University of Cape Town sits on. And so this is very much a, a memorial to his beneficence. Uh, that was how it was intended, that this was his land that he has given to the public. And what happened with the Rhodes Must Fall protest was a public reclaiming of this land. The, the, the students of the University of Cape Town said, why is he still here? We do not actually view this as ever being rightfully his land. And we are challenging in public his continuing presence as a symbol. Um, and so part of what's happening in these protests is that 
there is new access that people have to make their claims in public, to actually challenge the presence of some of these artifacts and these art objects, and to actually uh, enter into debates as to whether they still are serving any purpose for the people that now occupy these spaces. So what I'm also hearing from you is that there is a kind of continuum with this. And so there's, 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 there's not an absolute because clearly, you know, I'm hearing from you that it's kind of like this on, on both ends. And Tom, it looks like you're leaning in. Yeah. Were you about to say something? And then I want to go to how we back art and bring in you, Kwame, because I'm wondering what, when the rubber hits the road and, and we're talking about art that's put out for public consumption, is there a different way in which the public ascribes a kind of value to that art if it happens to come from, you know, people who are not othered, right? And I'm thinking about the financial bottom lines. So, but before I get to that, Tom, I saw you leaning in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so listen, I, I, uh, we were bumping up against all the things we should be bumping up against. And, you know, one of them is art is the possibility of healing, um, actions with the transfer of art as redemptive right is, is one theme today but there's another role for art and, and that's of coping so there, you know, there are two two reactions to trauma the things you can cope with and the things you can heal and um one of the great healing stories we just have in, in hartford right now an exhibition at the library about the history of hip-hop in hartford and and hip-hop as a um a dynamic phenomenon that was a coming together around positive goals and then demonized in certain sectors. And then it, a question came up last night. Well, you know, how long did it take to work? And, and was it really a redemptive project in the end or did it just get commercialized and globalized? Um, similar to today, it's an unresolvable problem. But, but when I think about it, you know, there's such catharsis around art and that's adjudicated in the public eye. Right, it it is about fame. Uh, art and fame are inextric inextricably tied, and sometimes it's you know dissent, like Picasso's Guernica is a protest piece to war, or many of Jean Michel Basquiat's works as as an expression again in, in hip hop culture um, of the realities of the street. But you know at the same time, that's what these Confederate monuments were. They were just, they were a coping mechanism a hundred years ago for people who um, you know, wanted to deny the injustice. And, and you know, the spoiled treasures from Byzantium on display in Venice is about cultural dominance or, you know, the reuse of pharaonic art in Roman imperial monuments was a, was a statement. And so, um, setting matters, you know, and, and, and the cultural context is not just about the setting. It, it's also about what that society is striving towards and, and what's, what it's feeling and, and what it's hurting from. And well, you know, that also makes me think about then access again, right? Because who are the people that we're talking about who, who get in to be able to see that, to be able to express? And then it says a lot about in terms of what's in the town square and exactly the points that you raised, Tom, which about, you know, Confederate monuments, right? So it was very interesting, right? It's sort of like their placement. And then Kwame, yeah, unmute Kwame to go there, right? So, you know, what's accessible that you have to pay for behind the museum wall and then what is put in front of you to see all the time which is like the dominant that even if they lost here in the confederate war every time you go to the town square there they are you know standing very as a very dominant reminder so kwame please unmute and add to this conversation and i'm curious about when the rubber hits the road what it means in terms of real value do people pay yeah. you Hey, for what you do. Yeah. Well, first of all, I have a museum in Ghana. It's currently about 53 acres and still expanding. And uh, it has my work. And in, in building this museum, uh, a lot of things came to me. I've been learning over the years. And um, why did I try to start to build this museum? Because number one, when our ancestors' work entered white spaces, white museums, they were, they entered those museums as fetish 
British um, objects of interest. Uh, something to, you know, just to draw people in and then maintain their, uh, their just, you know, uh, entertain them. This was a reason why the work's going in there. And it brings the question of how racism keeps evolving just so that racism can exist and keep up uh, the motive of white supremacy. So we are going to capture your work, display it out of context in a, in a museum, and then 600 years down the line, okay, we are no, going, no longer going to describe it as a fetish. We are going to find nicer words to describe it. When in the first place, the space for which it entered were not open to our ancestors. They were closed white spaces. So um, this is why I try to make my work more accessible. Uh, accessibility is a key part of doing art. Um, the artworks being displayed um, or our ancestors' work were not necessarily for fame. And I had to even relook at how I work because I, I trained at university and indirectly I got some of these European concepts, white concepts in my mind. In my new work, uh, I just shared it to um, on, the, on the chat platform. You can follow the link and check it out. In my new work, um, something came to my realization that even being an artist, in the European context is very elitist because the artist is the only one who gets to choose the symbols that is supposed to communicate to the audience. The artist is the only one who gets to choose the imagery and you, you know the semantics and the words that is used to describe the work and everybody else is supposed to take it for what it is. It's a very, very um, European wide pre privileged concept. Down here or up here in Africa, it's a, total, it's a totally different I, uh, idea. It's a community thing. We have it, we have the arts. It's not just material culture like you, you will have it in a European museum. It's living culture. So in my new work, I try to um, have the work. Um, the title is uh, Blank Slate Palimpsest. And um, I was happy when Caroline in a previous uh, panel kept drawing attention to the effect of palimpsest. So I entitled it Blank Slate Palimpsest Monument. And it is just a little attempt to have people or the public become part of the, the narrative, part of the symbols that are chosen. So I do still have, um, there's still a lot that needs to be discussed when it comes to our art in, in public spaces. And yes, uh, funding is very hard because my work draws attention to work that, um, to narratives and phenomenon that makes people very uncomfortable. And now because it's about fame, it's about support and it's about what people want, it's about what, um, it's about celebrities who will appeal to a big audience. You don't get funding. You, got, you don't, because you are going to bring in the shame of you, you are the one who is going to ruin the party. Uh, you have this nice exhibition with bourgeois um, <laughs> uh, guests drinking wine, wanting to talk about philosophy of the human progress, and then here is somebody whose work is reminding you that, hello, we are not progressing. You, you are only, progress. you think you are progressing because you, are, you have a, a different gaze. But if you are looking at humanity from our point of view, everybody in here in this gallery is a savage. You know, so um, it's a lot to take in. That's a, that's a lot. <laughs> it reminds me of, uh, a, a, an art book, a table book called Without Sanctuary. And Without Sanctuary 
provides its its photographs that were taken from postcards mostly involving lynchings because people would these were postcards that that were important to people and they'd write notes to their family members like gee i was able to be at a lynching i mean really powerful disturbing etc and this kind of history of all these lynchings not all of them but they captured what they do in this book but what was interesting is that when there was uh efforts to do a tour of this there was resistance right so it's interesting sort of who has the power to sort of send these out at a time in the 1920s 30s and 40s and celebrate lynching in america like i was at a lynching and here's my postcard versus then later on let's catalog these and let's show them to people and museums saying well no that's not that's not right for us all right our time is coming to an end and so i want us to end on this note about what makes a healing place and we only have a couple of minutes because i want to get sarah back on so that we can close out together but Layla, may i start with you um and this thought about what makes for a healing place when we think about art oh, that's so difficult and i know it's been the, the theme of today part well one of the themes the healing place i think a healing place is i guess it would encompass some of what we discussed during this panel about place that is accessible to people where they feel safe. And I know some of these topics were discussed earlier where someone feels physically safe, a uh, place where people are free to express themselves with, you know, in a way where they're able to articulate their true purpose, the purpose of their work or, um, yeah, where they, where they feel safe. Um, and I think a lot of it is context. And for me, a lot of this goes back to, goes back to context and that we present thing and, uh, objects, materials in, um, in an authentic way. Thank you. Kellen, healing place. What makes healing in art? Um, what makes for healing in art, I think is, uh, so is the awareness in creating spaces in which uh, very complex processes can take place, um, especially if we're talking about the, the various traumas or uh, afterlives of slavery, of oppression, colonialism. Uh, these were not instantaneous and they will not be resolved or done away with instantaneously. Um, and so what makes for uh, a healing place is uh, a space in which art can deal with uh, discomfort, can deal with um, affects such as shame, such as uh, disgust, um, such as, uh, uh, in other words, uh, anything that isn't necessarily promising fullness, anything that isn't promising immediacy, so that people can gather and actually experience what uh, otherwise may not be, uh, there may not be space for in the world. Thank you for that. Tom healing place, healing space. I think access is so important. Uh, a radical access agenda though is beyond making things free. We made things, we made access for the residents of Hartford free to the Wadsworth about four and a half years ago. Um, that's not enough, right? That just enables other things. Uh, having a rich collection that can be mined, that can successfully help us cultivate the past to talk about now and the future. Mm -hmm. is an essential element. We're blessed with great collections that way here. Um, but another radical access idea is, is to, to use the digital to push it out and to let someone else come in and tell the story. Like museums don't need to only tell their own stories. They need to be co-creators. And to be a good co-creator, you need to give linguistic, physical, and intellectual access to the things that are that you hold in the public trust. Mm. And that is a uh, very long term ambition, but it's it's one that we can have because we have uh, this a culture of openness, a culture of self critique, uh, and a culture of accountability within the within um, the arts ecosystem, at least in this part of the country. So uh, it's not perfect, but I'm hopeful. Those are great ideas going forward, right? And that it's not just an, enough to just say the doors are open, but to do more in terms of what's behind the doors. Yeah. Kwame, who, who holds the mic and what story gets told is very important. Right? Exactly. It, it, right. It's, it was the saying that the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter until the lion has its say. 
Kwame, let me end with you in terms of uh, what makes for healing. I think a healing place is a, a place that factors uh, the patient's idea of what healing is. Um, uh, being from Africa and then being a Black person, we continuously over the years um, have to listen to what our oppressor thinks is healing for us. When for Black people in America or for uh, Africans all over the world, that may not necessarily be healing. Um, trust is a major part of healing. And until um, the opinions of the patients or, or of the victims are considered, then we can have a proper healing place. Yeah, accessibility is also very important. So thanks to all uh, my co-panelists for highlighting that, you know, continuously. Well, it's been uh, a and pleasure to be with you and to moderate this panel. Uh, thank you. I'm so grateful to each of you, Layla, Tom, Kwame, Helen, Thank you so much. I'm going to invite Sarah Bronin back. And thank you, Arthur, as well. Uh, invite Sarah uh, back as we close out and as we give gratitude to those of you who joined us uh, as panelists, as well as to those who joined us as attendees. Sarah, I'll turn it over to you to close us out. Great. Thanks, Michelle. What a great last panel. Uh, just a note to say, well, first, thanks to Michelle for entertaining the idea of doing this together and, and uh, to the UC Irvine staff for making it all possible and to Mariah Lindsay for helping us uh, with so many of the details that, that uh, made today hopefully pretty seamless for, for the viewers. Um, you will be able to access recordings of this event uh, through Eventbrite. We'll send, send them around. Um, and uh, you know, again, thanks to everybody for attending and hope you have a wonderful weekend and, and that you take some of the things that we've discussed, uh, carry them with you uh, as you go through your lives. Thank you. Thank you.